So I will start to talk about the use of point of care ultrasound outside the operating room. That's my field as a non-anesthesiologist. And I will try to show you how I use in my practice and a little bit of literature on this. Um, this is my disclosure is that um, the, the main disclosure I have is as you can see here, I'm so passionate that uh, my daughter has been practicing ultrasound when she was uh, essentially one year old. Um, time is a problem because in 20 minutes, there's not much opportunity. Happy to answer a question at the end. And uh, I saw that Azad has been posting uh, literature. This is a great uh, way of uh, providing more material for the audience. But the, I, I know that you all know, but uh, when we talk about POCOS, uh, especially in a group of uh, very expert anesthesiology that do transesophageal, uh, and you are uh, considered the expert in the field, what do you think about polytocular ultrasound? This is the definition that uh, I like the most, uh, is uh, every time you think about polytocular ultrasound is that he's a clinician that perform and interpret an ultrasound based up on a problem. So it's clinician perform, is very limited in scope and goal directed. Uh, is done at the bedside. Then I will show you cases. Uh, the interpretation is real time, not hours after the fact. Uh, the findings are recognizable and definite. It's mostly a yes, no, um, often uh, uh, characterization. Uh, and of course, it's part of my armamentarium is that uh, I still use a lot of my stethoscope. I still use a lot of my hands when I assess in the patient. And of course, the training uh, is something that we can talk at the very end. So to explain and show you um, how this concept uh, can work is that um, I'm just gonna present you one case is that it was a patient that I saw a few years ago, uh, 62. Um, she has history of schizophrenia and seizure disorder. It was admitted to the psychiatric ward, uh, hospital day seven. Uh, was part of the rapid response team and we were called because of the crisis of consciousness. So to be honest is that they told us that we think she's seizing. When I arrived on the floor, um, she was clean in shock. Tachycardic with a 30 pulse, we could not get a saturation, uh, no ID access present. The skin, the skin was modest, she was still obeying, but honestly uh, quite drowsy. So I was clearly facing uh, uh, undifferentiated and shock uh, in a almost an hostile environment as a psychiatric war with uh, no much resources and no IV access. So the first thing I did is that um, looking at IVC and uh, Andre's presentation was uh, uh, clearly showing how you can actually use this on transthoracic and transesophageal. In my case, it was transthoracic. And in all surprises, I was expecting a collapse in IVC. The vast majority of situation that we see on the floor when we are called is usually sepsis, uh, hypovolemia. This was uh, a very surprising IVC, to be honest. Uh, and for the audience, a little bit more expert, you can immediately see that it was something that you immediately caught my attention at this level of the right atrial junction. But of course is that uh, because there's a congestive IVC pattern, I immediately and quickly turn to the Sucosta view. And this is what I saw is that uh, uh, an RV that is dilated and something floating, uh, or it looked like floating in the um, right atrium and uh, an underfill LV. Um, quickly moving to the parasternal, uh, uh, D shape of the septum. There was a pre excellent presentation this morning talking about uh, RV dysfunction. Uh, the asymmetric indexes was clearly showing me uh, pressure overload of the uh, right ventricle. And uh, in uh, uh, RV inflow view, you can clearly see here that there was a thrombus, or at least a, a echogenic uh, mobile mass uh, coming from the inferior vena cava, what I showed you at the very beginning. Because it's not just uh, ultrasound, echo, cardiography, but this critical key ultrasound from my perspective is that I quickly moved to the groin uh, and uh, I found uh, the confirmation of my hypothesis that there was uh, a thrombus uh, in the common femoral vein. Um, I used ultrasound uh, to put a central line in this patient on the floor. We quickly transferred the patient to the ICU. She got TPA at arrival uh, in the ICU because I called the team to be prepared for TPA and the patient uh, managed to be not intubated and leave the ICU in two days with shock resolution in less than 24 hours. We later did a, a CT chest that confirmed our findings 
And the radiology called us uh, very worried about the findings and we thought that we know already and the patient already got treatment for this. Really, if you think is that uh, I was the clinician and I did it. My question was, uh, what is the shock here? Is obstructive, uh, is hypovolemic? Uh, I did it at bedside, not even in the ICU, but the only psychiatry ward. I interpret the findings in real time and they were pretty simple and definite. And of course, that this was part of my physical examination is I started with the vitals and observing the patient. Um, what is the literature on this? Is that um, this is a systematic review meta-analysis recently published on the use of point of ultrasound for diagnosis of shock etiology. And look at the likelihood ratio is that if you add point of care ultrasound to your uh, clinical armamentarium, uh, your uh, likely positive like ratio, negative like ratio, they are significant and you will uh, dramatically improve uh, your diagnostic accuracy for uh, any form of shock. But it's not just the diagnostic accuracy because again, is that uh, life is not so simple, is that this patient was very straightforward from a certain way and the diagnosis was unique. But we do know that uh, patients are complex and often is multifactorial. So in this study, uh, published in Clerical Medicine 2015, they use a very interesting index. It's a sort of the explore the concept of a reduction in diagnostic uncertainty. Think about uh, our clinical reason, right? Is that we often have a patient uh, that is shocky and we start thinking about, oh, this would be this, this, and this. And um, the reality is, uh, um, ultrasound uh, may not be able to give us the smoking gun, the single diagnosis, but definitely we'll be able to rule out other causes. We'll be able to reduce our diagnostic uncertainty as shown in this, in this study where uh, for all diagnosis of shock, uh, there was a 27% uh, reduction in diagnostic uncertainty. So when you think about the point of care ultrasound is this is fast because you have it at the bedside and the previous speaker even discussed about the use of, on crazy emergency like uh, difficult airway management uh, is uh, quite accurate. Uh, and when it's not perfect, it still helps us uh, by mitigating the diagnostic uncertainty. I show you already briefly by using vascular ultrasound, this is not just echocardiography. Uh, I really use uh, the ultrasound as my stethoscope. Even more is that I use it for brain, chest, diaphragm, airway, heart, abdomen, and vascular applications. For the one that are interested, this is a great uh, uh, consensus uh, and expert recommendation uh, um, manuscript uh, that we published uh, last year in collaboration with the ESICM. Uh, just to show you two very quick cases about uh, how this is uh, whole body ultrasound as Christian Alzora talk about uh, in the pregnant uh, patients. This was a gentleman uh, uh, that was unfortunately admitted to our ward uh, with um, post-severe traumatic brain injury. Um, and the team uh, on the floor called us because the patient was tachypneic. Um, and they even called the nephrologist because it was having uh, increased uh, uh, creatinine and they were thinking about uh, um, some form of kidney injury. When I arrived uh, to the ward, the patient was uh, again in shock to keep naked clearly uh, um, with a 30 pulse uh, hypotensive uh, and uh, the IVC was collapsing. As I look at the abdomen, uh, I noticed that there was free fluid in the abdomen. Is that um, uh, um, Andre show you how you can uh, ass uh, assess free fluid from a transesophageal is that in transesophageal it's even easier. And uh, there was not just free fluid. There was, uh, as you can see here, some echogenicity inside the free fluid, something very strange. So at that point, uh, I asked myself, why a patient with traumatic brain injury now is showing a free fluid in the abdomen uh, associated with sepsis? I quickly asked uh, the nurse at the bedside if any procedure had been done uh, in the past 48 hours. And the patient turned out that he had uh, a very challenging insertion of gastrostomy tube, uh, and uh, at that point, uh, I, I immediately suspected uh, a malposition in my N uh, of the G tube uh, with essentially feeding into the peritoneum. The patient went straight to the operating room after being intubated and resuscitated. And there was uh, misplacement of the tube uh, with several 
essentially liters of feeds in this peritoneal cavity. Um, this is another gentleman. Uh, it was a multi-system trauma that unfortunately developed severe respiratory failure with a PF fresh of less than 100. There was some concern about uh, his uh, uh, brain. Uh, he had, uh, of course, sinusomatic injuries about the multi-system trauma. And the neurosurgeon, they wanted to repeat uh, uh, a CT imaging to decide if it was indicated or not to insert a, a parenchymal, interparenchymal monitor for ICP measurement. The problem was it was very unstable and uh, we weren't sure it would have been safe for him to be moved uh, to the OR, to the CT, sorry. So what I did, I did uh, two uh, brain ultrasonography technique, a transcranial Doppler on this side and here optic sheet diameter assessment. And um, just for the one that are not familiar, here I'm at the level of the middle cerebral arteries. Uh, and this is a very concerning flow. This is a patient that, that has uh, a very reduced respiratory flow. If I see this, this is uh, elevated what we call pulsatility index uh, that is uh, uh, being associated with elevated intracranial hypertension. At that time, uh, it was uh, very easy at the point for me to discuss with the surgeon and the decision was to insert uh, uh, an ICP monitor. Unfortunately, the patient progressed uh, over the course of the uh, next few days uh, in terms of his uh, uh, intracranial hypertension. And this is, uh, again, the MCA at the level. And here is the internal carotid artery here, and this is the MCA. Just to tell you is that uh, usually there is systole-diastole flow. It means that there is a continuous flow at the level of this vessel. You can see here there is pulsatility. You only see stroke volume, essentially flow during systole. And on pulse by Doppler, the flow changed dramatically compared to the one I showed you before. This is now an oscillatory flow when you have flow reverse under diastole and uh, um, suggested an extremely elevated ICP and unfortunately the patient progressed to brain death. Again, without... Uh, uh, moving the patient to CT, we were able to immediately identify a life-threatening condition and have a proper discussion with the neurosurgical team. Um, this is a very interesting study that was published uh, uh, this year, the IMPRESET 2 study, where they look at the transcranial Doppler use as a screening test to exclude intracranial hypertension. And then you can see here, there is an excellent negative predictive value. And the idea is that uh, if I do transcranial Doppler in a patient where I'm suspecting or I'm afraid of uh, intracranial hypertension, and I don't see any, um, there is a formula in this study that is so used to estimate the ICP. And if the ICP is not elevated according to the transcranial Doppler, unlikely the patient will actually have intracranial hypertension uh, for uh, when you insert a parenchymal monitor or an EVD. So again, it's a very useful tool when there is some uncertainty and you want to increase your likelihood of uh, um, doing the right thing for the patient. So from this few initial examples, you can see how point of care ultrasound can be used essentially in two big categories. Is that one is that uh, you know the ultrasound may help you, but it's not promptly available. So when there is uh, an emergent urgent need for clinical evaluation and your cardiovascular anesthesiologist that is excellent for the ATEE or your cardiologist colleague are not available. And when these findings uh, from uh, hocus facility physical examination essentially is that I'm expanding my physical exam, allow for what? More rapid triage. I thrombolize the patient in less than 20 minutes from my initial call. And of course, is that uh, the clinical man management was very, very directed and focused. There is another way of using this, is that when uh, it's not practical, right? Is that I cannot ask uh, the cardiology team or the echo lab to come every day, multiple times a day to do an ultrasound in my ICU patient. And so when I need frequent CD examination to follow up on ultrasound findings, uh, or really as a physical examination of jump. So to give you, again, a little bit more example is that how you can use these in this situation is that it was a patient that, that uh, the nephrology team called me, known uh, in stage on disease, on dialysis, admitted the night, the night prior to an emergency department, uh, 
for uh, respiratory failure. And uh, the uh, nephrology was concerned because the blood pressure was a little bit soft uh, and they asked me to admit the patient to the ICU for uh, facilitating a uh, uh, SLED because they told me, I don't think she can tolerate IHD. Um, so I went to see the patient. She was bed spaced on a surgical ward because there were no beds in the nephrology ward. And uh, to my surprise, uh, Look at this IVC. This IVC is very different from uh, what you would expect uh, in a patient that has uh, fluid overload and she skipped a dialysis session and everybody thinking that she is overloaded uh, uh, from a fluid perspective. So I initially say, okay, this is does make sense. So uh, of course I look at the heart. And uh, if you look at the heart is that the RV doesn't look particularly dilated. And uh, you start to appreciate that there's something strange on the mitral valve. The mitral valve doesn't look normal. And again, at that time, actually, the, there was nothing in the admission note uh, talking about valvulopathy. Uh, I moved to the uh, apical for chamber view. And again, this mitral valve is clearly not normal. And when you look at the Doppler, there was uh, even flow acceleration in PISA at velocity of 61 centimeter per second. And so clearly suggesting a severe, more than to severe uh, uh, mitral stenosis. And you can see also here in the parasternal long axis view of this mitral valve. And it turned out that the patient had a known uh, mitral stenosis. It was in a moderate to severe spectrum. Uh, and uh, the, she recently transferred to another dialysis center and that was not known to our nephrology team. Uh, as I was performing the parasternal long axis view, I noticed something on the background. That's why I kept this uh, 20 centimeter deep uh, parasternal long. You can see here is that again, not just heart, but also lung is that uh, there is something in the left pleural space uh, that is uh, icogenic. So there was a consolidation there. So I moved my attention to the lung. Let's keep this. Uh, I moved my attention to the lungs, and this is on the right side. The right side was absolutely normal. Is that uh, uh, Christian show you patient with B lines, and I think you saw also this morning in, the, in one of the first presentations, is that this patient on the right lung was completely normal. Again, completely against the, the initial diagnosis of fluid overload. But when I moved to the right side, uh, here I'm at the apex, okay? This is the apex of the lung. And here is the base, you can appreciate here is the diaphragm, and this is the spleen. This patient had a complete collapse and consolidation of the left lung. At that point, I knew that uh, the patient was a very different diagnosis on what she was sold to me. I transferred to the ICU, I ordered for a chest X-ray, and this is the new chest X-ray less than 10 hours after the initial one. And it turned out that the patient had a, a, a MSSA bacteremia, with a left low lower non pneumonia and uh, a mucus plug that, that uh, had in the left main stem. All of this, again, in less than 20 minutes uh, by performing uh, ultrasound. Uh, what do we know about the effect, the efficacy of using uh, point of care ultrasound for patients with respiratory symptoms? Is that this is a study from uh, Christian Lorsen uh, in, uh, from the Denmark uh, on Lancet Respiratory Medicine, where uh, emergency medicine patient presenting to, to the emergency department with uh, respiratory failure were randomized to a point of care ultrasound, multi-organ ultrasound approach versus standard of care, whatever standard of care. And what they clearly found is that the point of care ultrasound was associated with better diagnosis, faster diagnosis. Um, most of the patients I showed you so far, they were patients that I was uh, involved as a part of the rapid response team, so not necessarily in the ICU. And this is a study from France uh, where they implemented a point of care ultrasound, uh, sort of a, a protocol uh, in their rapid response team. When they look at the both respiratory failure and shock, uh, and what they found is that uh, in the patient that they have a point of care ultrasound assistant assessment, uh, there was, uh, much higher, correct, uh, immediate, adequate diagnosis, correct diagnosis. And again, this was a small study, so I don't think we can make any inference on mortality, but they show also mortality difference. But honestly, it was a small group, uh, uh, num small number, so we can't really make this such an inference for this. Um, what about uh, this 
second part, right, is that uh, when frequency examination and follow-up ultrasound findings of the as a physical examination adjunct, um, um, we are finally hopefully coming out of this uh, long COVID uh, era. And this is one of one of the patients that we saw during I think wave two or wave three. Um, we were again called on the floor. I was uh, on the medicine ward, a uh, patient with uh, instational disease, uh, COVID positive. Uh, the team uh, uh, consulted us because they thought that it was progressing uh, on COVID uh, pneumonia. So they called us if we need, they need to bring him down because the patient is um, with a COVID pneumonia. Um, I started with my ultrasound assessment uh, and this is what I found uh, on the right side. So a, a quite a dense consolidation, some proreffusion. And if you notice this, is first of all, this is not a typical ca characteristics of, of uh, a COVID pneumonia. COVID pneumonia has very different characteristics uh, on lung ultrasound. Usually the, the consolidation are not large and massive. Uh, and on top of that also, there was, if you pay attention here, there are multiple sort of nodular lesion. This is uh, a typical characteristics uh, of uh, a necrotizing pneumonia. These are all multiple uh, lung abscesses, uh, and the patient turned out having a staph aureus pneumonia. On superimposed on his COVID infection, for sure, but this was not a simple COVID pneumonia. As a part of the assessment, we look at the heart, and as you can see here, how the heart was hyperdynamic with a very small. Uh, uh, RVs. The patient had a very, very poor parastatal analytical view, so I turned out doing a sub-costal uh, short axis view. It's now day three, and uh, the patient is now having worsening shock. So again, uh, being able to repeat my ultrasound and also to take advantage of all the fact that I knew already how the patient looked like uh, on ultrasound prior. is now on significant shock is that uh, is on norepinephrine, vasopressin, and epinephrine. So something has changed. I have a question for the ultrasound. So I start with my problem is a cardiac ultrasound here because it's in shock. And if I don't have the answer on the cardiac ultrasound, what I do is that I look at other area. And you can see here the IVC is very different from a septic anesthetic patient. And when I look at the um, Subcostal view and parastatal view is that the RV dramatically change. This is not anymore an, an RV that is small and underfill. COVID pneumonia, as you know, is associated with uh, increased thrombosis. I immediately move. Oh, I immediately move to the groin uh, and I found a clot. Again, in uh, in a ten minutes, uh, we had uh, a different diagnosis. Uh, of course, something that he was in our differential. But uh, at that time, moving a patient with COVID pneumonia was very difficult in CT, as you may remember, is that uh, how the, all the infection prevention control were quite different at that time. And we started treatment uh, right away. It's now day nine, same patient. And again, as I told you, as a part of my physical examination, uh, if I can, I always bring with me ultrasound. Not on every patient, but especially in patients are particularly challenging. It's a little bit small here. I apologize for this. But if you can see here, this was on May 7. Okay, May 7. On the right side, it is sliding. And trust me, even if it's small, uh, there was some sliding here. But when I look at the new image on May 10, I could not see sliding, pulse, or vertical artifact. At that point, I had suspicion of, of a complication. There is uh, pneumothorax. Uh, and as I moved down uh, and laterally, I found what we call the lump point. This is a very interesting lump point because it's not just air and air, but it is a uh, hydro lump point. When I have on this side, the air in the pleural space and here also a fluid in the pleural space. And of course, at that point, uh, I ordered, ordered a chest X-ray. We don't do routinely anymore chest X-ray dead in the ICU. And clearly we identify the pneumothorax. This is uh, um, a patient that we we admitted uh, last year in terms of uh, what you can do with ultrasound in terms of uh, um, decision making in the ICU is that as you can see it's a dense consolidated uh, uh, lung uh, is a patient unfortunately was a near drowning in Lake Ontario, um, very epoxic uh, and difficult to manage. 
What I try to do, I try to do a quick recruitment maneuver with ultrasound visualization. And you can see is that by increasing my PEEP and doing a 30 by 30, but a very simple sustained inflation, I noticed immediately that the lung was from being densely consolidated was moving to a B pattern with multiple B lines clearly telling me that this patient was recruitable and I felt more comfortable, even in the context of a shock, to increase dramatically the PEEP. Um, in this study from uh, uh, 2022, in Journal, this is a study from uh, um, a group from the Netherlands, uh, where they look at, they look at the, across different departments and showing you ICU, but there are also medicine and emergency department in their study, showed us how Performing lung ultrasound in these populations and these settings can dramatically change your diagnosis and also lead to a, a therapeutic impact change. 40%, more than 40% of the patient, when you do lung ultrasound in your ICU, will lead to diagnosis change. Think about the patient I just described to you, and also management change. Increasing PEEP, decreasing PEEP, doing a bronchoscopy, or uh, for example, uh, doing a recruitment maneuver or putting a chest tube. Don't forget that it's POCOS is only one piece of the puzzle. Um, be very careful because what can lead is that you can actually cause harm if you use ultrasound as the only way of assessing your patient. This was a guy that was admitted a few years ago when I was still working at Toronto Western. Presented to emergency department with abdominal pain, a little bit of elevated LFTs, uh, and a new onset atrial fibrillation. A POCUS was done in emergency department. And there was a report uh, in the chart saying normal gestion fraction, no regional abortion normalities, uh, and the patient was referred to general surgery for pancreatitis. Now is day three, and uh, our rapid response team is called because of uh, worsening respiratory status, worsening tachycardia. This is his uh, uh, parastandard long axis view, is um, tachycardic in the concept of FA, but you can see here maybe a little bit of reduced ejection fraction, but not terrible. This is his uh, parastandard short axis, again, very good. This is the apical for chamber view. Again, something that an so cost of you, something that uh, very consistent with the initial focus that was done in the emergency department. So what's the problem is that uh, what's happening here is that uh, at the time the fellow was uh, uh, a wonderful uh, uh, anesthesiology actually that was working with us and is now in London, Ontario he is uh, um, Wilfredo Quintas. And Wilfredo put his stethoscope on the chest of the patient and he heard a significant murmur. So, what Wilfredo did is that he continued his examination and he found a flail valve. The patient has a ruptured corda and was quickly identified, transferred to the general, went for a, a surgical repair, and he did extremely well. Again, this patient, his elevated LFT amylase was actually cardiac congestion, leading to um, liver congestion. So it's a great tool, but we need to be very careful because uh, as just one piece of the diagnostic puzzle, of course, is that focus finding may corroborate and support our pretest hypothesis, but can also dramatically mislead us if you're not aware of our limitation. They can also be completely inconsequential and not supported, but not changing the hypothesis plan. It's okay. We, I will continue with other tests. And in extreme, in very, not very rare, but in some circumstances, they completely change the protest hypothesis and lead to something completely unexpected. Think about uh, the lady where I was really not thinking about pulmonary embolism, to be honest. Uh, I was mostly thinking about septic shock or hypovolemia. So in terms of take-home messages is that uh, you can use point of ultrasound when uh, you don't have access uh, rapidly to the expert sonographer. Or where really is that this is not practical because uh, you cannot really have uh, your uh, cardiac sonographer or your uh, cardiac anesthetist coming every day, multiple times a day to do your physical exam for you. POCUS may narrow differential diagnosis 
And if, um, even if it's something that uh, is not really changing my hypothesis, definitely give me more confidence. Allow for repeat monitoring can lead, uh, remember in ICU more than 40% of ultrasound lead to the management changes. And of course, the system for procedure. What we don't have yet is clear data on patient outcomes. And so I think is that we need to be very careful with that perspective and that's to be some of the work that we all should consider for the future is to really show that there is a benefit for this patient. And I like this statement from endocrine Patrick that is an intensive research trauma surgeon from Alberta that years ago wrote, uh, the greatest benefit to the patient will be realized when this diagnostic technology is incorporated into thoughtful patient assessment, your physical exam, your history, your pretest, and incorporate your possible information considering the patient physiology. Um, this is uh, the, how I think when I approach point of care ultrasound. I ask myself if the patient has, uh, if the probe has a question for the probe, if I can answer something with ultrasound, if the answer is not, I just go straight for MRI, CT, or whatever. And then I focus on the acquisition. I need to get good views. And only when I have good views, I proceed with the interpretation, and then I put all the pieces of my puzzle together. And um, I'm happy to take questions, uh, uh, and I hope that uh, um, you found the talk useful. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alberto. As always, an uh, amazing topic, really practical. I I have watched it, like your presentation so many times, and I you always bring something new to me. Thank you so much. Um, before um, bef um, before we start the the focus case and Q and A sessions, we have a few like questions. Um, the first question goes to the um, Dr. Duno, Dr. Bullock, and and also um, to you, Alberto. Um, so. The question is, any pearls on distinguishing atelectasis from, pneum from pneumonia on ultrasound? And also, um, Dr. Dono, Dr. Dr. Bullock, um, how difficult it is to do this um, diagnosis using CHI? Uh, Sorry, I missed the question. Uh, I was trying to open the camera. Ah, OK, no, no problem. I'm going to repeat. So um, uh, the, the audience is asking any pearls on distinguishing atelectasis from, from pneumonia on ultrasound. And also for you two guys that talk about TE, uh, is it possible to make the, the, this diagnosis using TE instead of TTE only? Yeah. <clears throat> so um, I think Dr. Cavallas had a similar question this morning regarding how to differentiate pneumonia from atelectasis. Mm -hmm. um, one of the way that people have thought is that when you have atelectasis, you have hypoxic vasoconstriction. Okay, when you have pneumonia, you're gonna have a shunt. That's why the patient will uh, will vasodilate, will, will have hypoxia. So, um, uh, so in the case, in some cases where I clearly had a pneumonia, when you put color Doppler on the lung tissue you're gonna see flow everywhere, everywhere. On the other hand, when you have atelectasis, you don't see as much flow, probably because there's a vasoconstriction of this. So that's uh, that could be one way. One of my colleagues was looking at uh, uh, seeing if he, he could use Doppler uh, velocities or signals, you know, to differentiate the two, but that's, that's, about, that's about it. Uh, as Alex was mentioning, What's very useful uh, when you have a, a, an area uh, that you wonder, uh, is it a, a hematoma or blood clot, or is mm -hmm. it a, a tissue, lung tissue? Mm -hmm. And if you see flow, you know it's not an hematoma, uh, you know it's a tissue, it's lung tissue. But if you don't see any Doppler signal, that could indicate that you're having a blood clot over there. So that could be some, some of the ways that you could use. Alberto, you're doing a lot of long ultrasound. Would you like to comment? Yeah, if I can share my screen for a second, I'm going to show you is that this is a study published from uh, um, a group from the Netherlands. And I, I was the reviewer. That's why I know this study quite well. Is uh, what they did is that they use a sequential approach. So it's not just, not just one finding, but integration of three separate findings. They look at the presence or absence of dynamic bronchogram. 
they look at, as you were mentioning, Andre, is the presence or absence of flow. And then uh, uh, that's what I like in, also in the study is that uh, they integrated uh, the mm -hmm. clinical representation of the patient. So they calculated this uh, um, pneumonia uh, score, right? The CPIS is a score that we use uh, by routinely in, when we try to identify the di diagnosis HAP and VAP uh, in the ICU. And uh, what they show is that uh, by using this integration, uh, they were able to uh, significantly increase uh, the ability to differentiate uh, pneumonia from atelectasis. Um, it makes sense if you think. And I think is that again, is that uh, uh, the, the, what I like is that the, the fact that we need to think more about, uh, it's not just one single finding often, but it's the mm -hmm. integration. Uh, and also our pre-test probability and uh, the use of our stethoscope, to be honest, or our hands, our the blood works. Uh, it's, it's not a holy grail. It's a great tool in our momentarium. Yeah, and, and I like what Alex presented this morning and said, when you have an unstable, well, I would say, I would say like you, um, um, Alberto, I would start with transthoracic, but in the OR, if you have already a TE probe in, you should take full advantage if you decide to put a TPRO to get as much information as you can. And, and as you mentioned, when you have a pneumonia, you can have RV dysfunction, you can have left ventricular myocardial depression. Uh, it can be in a patient with cirrhosis, you'll see ascites. So I think the same way that you use the transthoracic probe to do your physical examination, when you put a TE probe, I would say, and especially when you, you're you not under pressure, you have times, which has happened in the ICU, I think, take full advantage of the T-Pro, get all the information that you can get. I had one case, I didn't have time to show it, but it was in the middle of the night, we're called because this patient was in shock, lactate was in increased. This patient already had uh, LV dysfunction, but there was no reason why she would get worse. So finally, look at the heart, nothing. Look at the lung, nothing. Look at the abdomen, mm -hmm. and then I look at the liver, and there was air in the portal vein. Okay. Mm -hmm. So basically, this patient was having uh, uh, mesenteric ischemia, and there was air in the portal vessel. And the reason, uh, and this this micro, this is mesenteric ischemia, was creating a cardiointestinal syndrome. It was releasing cytokines, which was making the heart worse. Okay, mm -hmm. the right and the left heart worse. But the reason, you know, if you just look at the heart, said, well, the heart doesn't look bad, but it was already bad. But it was worse because there was mesenteric ischemia. And then we finally, we, we got an autopsy and we confirmed the findings, something we've, we've published. So, so there's, a, there's always a reason. There's always an explanation. Sometimes I used to say when I call it idiopathic because I'm too idiot to <laughs> find it. <laughs> That's my definition. But um, if you look for it, you'll find it. And, and TE is not just a TE probe to look at the heart. You, know, you can look everywhere, but always start, if you cannot get the information with transthoracic, I would always start with transthoracic, but if you cannot get, because the ICU has no acoustic windows, mm -hmm. then I go, uh, I go with TV. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Deneau. Thanks so much, Alberto. Um, um, Dr. Um, Bullock, um, have a, we have a question for you. In patients that have cardiac arrest, the risk is, like, is higher to have a esophageal perforation. Do you think that this like the the risk go up even higher with uh, TE in place? Um, yeah, this is a very interesting question, um, and it's a frequent uh, concern about the use of TE during cardiac arrest. So um, my answer would be yes, but um, as for safety issues, we don't have any specific literature um, available regarding the risk of injury during CPR with a TE probe in place. And to my knowledge, no adverse events specific to TE use during cardiac arrest have been reported so far. Uh, so we can only infer from um, ambulatory settings. But there's a very interesting uh, study published uh, recently in 2020, I think, um, in the uh, Journal of American College of uh, Cardiology. Um, they looked at TE safety during uh, structural cardiac heart procedures, mainly my, uh, mitral clips and LLA closures, uh, closure device. And in their study, they had a very high rate of esophageal and gastric lesion mm. uh, in about 86% of patients and 40% uh, 40 sorry, of these lesions were uh, classified as complex, meaning that they were um, 
intramural hematoma or uh, mucosal lacerations. Um, and interestingly, independent factors, uh, independent risk factors for uh, those complex lesions were um, identified as a, being a longer procedural mm -hmm. time under T manipulation and also uh, poor uh, image quality. So um, we could infer that uh, during resuscitation with a T probe in place, we could have a longer procedural time and also um, a harder time uh, with uh, image acquisition. So um, with this uh, study, I think we could say that the risk may be higher um, during cardiac arrest when we have a T probe in place, yes. But I don't have any uh, specific data for esophageal perforation per se. Okay, no, thank you. There is another question here that I just received. Um, how do you guys um, practically put put in the TE? Do, do, do they pause the CPR? And how long does it take to, to start this, the examination with the CPR in place? Um, it's, it's a very good question. Uh, it depends on if you have a protocol or not. If you do a T rescue later during the resuscitation, you put the probe in the the patient is already intubated. Uh, the data show that it takes about tw uh, 12 minutes before you have uh, the first image acquisition and uh, you have um, a, a great uh, feeling of I'm what's going on. Thank you, oh, mm, and, and when uh, when uh, you have a pro more of a protocol, uh, usually you can put the probe during the intubation, so you don't necessarily need to stop at the CPR, mm -hmm. but uh, some, pa some uh, physician just ask just for a little pause when they put the tube in so we could use the same pause to put the probe just after uh, so yeah that would be my answer okay if i can, uh, if I can add um, because we're getting more and more emergency physician that we train for t insertion and in fact that's what i do in my practice and that's what i teach is that when you take a camera laryngoscope and you uh, do your intubation the t probe is already ready the machine is already open mm -hmm. and then you put the tube, you put the T-probe at the same time under direct vision. Uh, there's been a recent study uh, from India in which they compare uh, video laryngoscopic insertion of T-probe versus blind and they clearly demonstrate reduced complication rate. So at mm -hmm. least you're going to eliminate uh, the or reduce significantly the pharyngeal complication. Mm -hmm. so, um, so the idea is to be your, have your T-probe ready uh and the, the tube ready and you do both at the same time so I then see. it takes just a few seconds and i always recommend also that when you insert the probe you should always well when you do it under direct vision you see that you're in esophagus but if you have any doubt you recommend to keep your image open so then you you know exactly that you'll see the arctic arch and you'll see the, the anatomic the normal anatomic structure as you insert uh as you insert the probe that's something we teach when we do workshops with the, because sometimes just upon the insertion, you'll see the arctic mm -hmm. dissection, you'll see the pathology. So um, uh, you don't want to miss that, that information. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Reynolds. Thank you so much, Dr. Bullock. We have a few more questions. Um, um, Dr. Zasso, um, since um, everything that you said is pretty much based on artifacts um, on ultrasound. Um, do you have any, like, do you change, how do you, do you optimize the settings for those? Like, uh, do you have any tips like on how to make this image better since you're just looking at artifacts? Do you like change harmonics? Do you turn off harmonics? Uh, do you change anything to make the, those image better? You know, like when you look into, into uh, the identification of the cricothyroid membrane, most of the time, the image is very clear because you don't have so many space in the neck. Um, uh, of course, you're looking to air interface, so you want to see bright. So increasing a little bit the brightness would be something that will be helpful. We normally use the, the linear probe, the simple linear probe for that. So it's very straightforward. Uh, um, I would say that the imaging acquisition is not the, the biggest problem, even if you have like a, Patients with high BMI is not as challenging. Normally, a little bit more challenging with, but like with a, a, a moderate level of uh, experience in the technique, you're going to be able to, to identify with no, no problem. Uh -huh. But but um, there is a question in the the Q and I about uh, indications, and I think that my 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 
thought about this is that it's very, very unlikely that they're going to be able to use this in the emergency setting. That's how it was like at the beginning uh, of proposed. I believe mm -hmm. more in pre-marking the, the membrane. Um, and people have said, okay, cricotinotomy will be like a very rare procedure. But of course, if you look into the NAP4 mm -hmm. uh, from UK, the, the major complication is postponing, like major complications that are advened from, from airway uh, management and leads to brain damage or death is because people keep post postponing doing the cryotherapy. So mm. if you have it pre-market, it's going to help to make the decision. So uh, a lot of things that will, will direct you to, into the right way. Mm -hmm. One thing that we do, Currently at Sinai, we are using this technique to improve our, this is not in the literature actually, but we are using the cricotide membrane identification to improve our awake intubations technique. So we we start to do like our transtracheal blocks guided by ultrasound, not real time, but like we mark the membrane and we can even like uh, measure the depth. And then this is going to give us like a more, uh, uh, feasible block and more uh, a higher success rate for that. And our our the, the quality of block that we get, the the, the, mm. the the freezing that we get is very very satisfactory for for of course uh, the providers and the patient. <clears throat> okay, no, perfect. Thank you so much, Fabrizio. Um, Doctor Arzola, um, I noticed. Uh, that I I would like to add something uh, to what Fabrizio was mentioning sure. about pre-marking uh, the membrane. <clears throat> Sometimes something new when you do it in the in the war, but I remember we have had a few cases in the past. For example, the typical case, preeclampsia, difficult airway, full stomach in the OR for a C-section. In those cases, we usually want to do a wave fiber optic intubation to those pregnant patients, we mark. And of course, the first time we did it, people say, well, what are you going to do? Are you going to do? No, no, no. It's just pre prevented just to know before you get to the point where you're no way rather than surgical airway. So we mark. And even for every show, we, we do uh, the transmembrane installation of, local, of lidocaine right. in a very nice, safe manner. So when you're doing your wave fiber optic, it's very elegant. You get into the trachea. And that is not really rejected much by the patient. So it's elegant, it's safe because you can mark. Mm -hmm. and, and it's something we advocate. And probably we go to the extreme, but we believe that every time you do an awake fiber optic intubation, it's the mm -hmm. final step because you may be in a situation not intubated, not a uh, bag mask. So in that case, we always try at least to scan and have an idea. And of course, have the kit for cryo thyroid membrane uh, puncture, which we have already a customized um, kit ready next to us in case. So put yourself in the worst scenario in order to be prepared for that situation mm -hmm. rather than actually attempting to do it. Yeah, no, that makes total sense, yeah. Thank you so much. And um, actually, I was about to ask you a question. Actually, this question you already answered on the Q&A, on the messages. But um, for those who didn't have a chance to, to look at, in patients with preeclampsia, um, they asked what's the mechanism of the pulmonary edema. And related to the focus on, on this type of patients, do you see any sort of like a systolic or diastolic dysfunction on patients with a pulmonary edema having preeclampsia? I want to be very honest and straight because there's a lot of research and we know a lot of information. We, we know that in preeclampsia, uh, the pulmonary edema can be multifactorial. But mm -hmm. when you read certain research, they still say oh, it's still controversial, uh, decrease in oncotic pressure, decrease in uh, increase in permeability, and also systolic or diastolic dysfunction. And all of those things is something you can check, even an increased BMP can be a predictor for cardiac problems, uh, cardiac complications in preeclamptic patients. So there's a lot of things you put together. And what we do usually, we try to do a, uh, a screening. Like Alberto always is teaching us just to, to have a screening of the patient, to have part of your physical examinations. So every time I have a preeclamptic patient 
that is severe, the blood pressure is not well controlled, uh, urine mm. output is not good, so they need to give fluid. We go there, we put the probe, uh, a standard, uh, simple language of sound, we say, yeah, we're okay, we can give. And then we come back later and we check again, language of sound is still okay. In that way, we can qualitatively, this is from the practical point of view, qualitatively know how things are going. Sometimes patients already come with some interstitial syndrome, and we know that it's a, pre, it's a state before eventually pulmonary edema. Mm -hmm. But uh, that is, is the situation. Sometimes we have uh, systolic dysfunction. Uh, sometimes we have diastolic dysfunction that can be direct uh, cause of the pulmonary edema. But again, at the bedside, if you're doing just pattern recognition, mm -hmm. of course, you need to start doing pulse wave Doppler, tissue Doppler to know the diastolic function. And it's something probably is beyond the bedside, the, the basic base yeah. bedside echo. Okay. Okay, thank you so much. We have time for like just one other question. Um, Alberto, um, what are the features that you are looking in brain pocos to exclude increased ICP? So um, the idea here is for transcranial Doppler is that uh, I can um, post in the chat uh, the, the impress it too. There are a series of um, uh, formulas that have been uh, uh, published in the literature. The study that I've uh, mentioned in my um, in my presentation uh, essentially uses uh, what they do is that uh, you always look at two key features: is that the flow velocity. Mm -hmm. more importantly, the diastolic velocity. The overall idea is this one, is that in the brain is a continuous flow, okay? Mm -hmm. So the diastolic flow, if you think about it, is that our brain is a low resistant circulation. So if it's a low resistant circulation, I'm expected to have a quite a high elevated diastolic flow. If I start developing uh, intracranial hypertension, my resistance at the level of the capillary will go up and therefore the resistance to flow will lead to progressive reduction on the diastolic flow. Mm -hmm. So very simple thing is that just visually is that I show you is that if your systolic and diastolic velo flow velocity is very, very broad, that's a bad sign. Uh, the formula that's been published they all try to, through regression uh, uh, formulas, is to estimate either the CPP or estimate mm. directly the ICP. Um, the, the, they are not the greatest, to be honest. And I think that's why the impressive trial show, clearly showed that, that uh, they're okay to rule, rule out. Okay. And that's how I use it. I do it if I see a gray flow and uh, with the formula, there's nothing telling me that the ICP is elevated it's highly unlikely that this patient has elevated ICP. But if I see an elevated ICP with the transcranial Doppler, then I need to ask myself, is it real? Do I really uh -huh. think that this patient has CT uh -huh. features, uh, pathophysiology, and other uh -huh. things discussed with the surgeon? Uh, but again, it's great at ruling out, uh -huh. not good at ruling in. Ruling in, yeah. Um, okay. But it ultimately is all about the features of this diastolic flow coming down. And then there are, there are other more complex analysis you can do, but that is a very simple one. Okay, no, thank you so much. Thank you, I appreciate. Um, um, and this concludes the Q&A session from, from, from our afternoon session. Thank you so much, guys.